I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to the Future of Money podcast. My goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have a one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. My guest today is Frederick Grigard, the CEO of the Cardano Foundation. One thing you may not know about Frederick is that he's a big mountain runner, and he's actually even recently completed a 400-kilometer race. So here you see, maybe Cardano is important, but it's also running. That's where he gets a lot of ideas. And by the way, another fun fact about Frederick, yeah, although he was born in Denmark, he's a Danish citizen, he also just became a Swiss citizen as well. So, so uh, good to have the, you know, the multinationality on, on there. Uh, Frederick, great to have you with us today on the Future Money podcast. Thank you very much, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, actually, you know, one thing people don't often don't know is that Frederick and I, we used to work at PwC together back in the good old days. And actually, to me, kick it off, uh, Fred, why don't you actually share with us about your background, and then we'll talk more about uh, this, this series, and we'll go more, more in-depth on uh, on Cardano. Sure. So uh, basically, I, I left uh, a small unit of the Special Forces in the Danish Army, and I, I went into university, and I had this amazing lecture around commodity trading and macroeconomics. So basically, I didn't have a lot of money. You know, the army doesn't pay well. And I walked down to the local bank. You know, I knocked on the, you know, the branch office, got in there and I said, I would like to uh, sell oil because, you know, I really thought, you know, this was the right trade to do. And the bank clerk just laughed at me and was like, you know, what are you doing here? You know, you don't have the approval or the necessary skill set to go short in oil, but I can sell you a mutual fund. And, you know, me being a bit stubborn, which I took up the argument and it suddenly dawned on me that the, the world actually has two or multiple systems. It has a systems for the privileged, the developed, the people who's born on the right side of the line, has the right contacts, has the right, you know, background. And then is, you know, basically the rest, which sometimes is referred to as the developing countries and other times just referred to as the average Joes. So my first mission or entry into uh, capital markets was really around how do we democratize the access to uh, capital markets. And then later I discovered it was even worse than I thought. Most people actually don't even have access to plain banking services and, you know, things we take for given as insurances and stuff like that. So that's actually kind of a little bit what put me on the early trail of what then later became, you know, building uh, several banks and, you know, building infrastructure for exchanges and then later, later Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and audit requirements and all of that. So, so that's a little bit about, you know, how I actually kind of from a very odd discussion somewhere I actually entered into a market, which is in many ways so needed, uh, and liquidity is so needed around the world, but in many other ways is really like very much in, in, in the hands of a few players and is guarded very well. Here we go. It's always there. We'll come back to your mountain running later on as well, uh, Frederick as well. But, uh, and I think you've been now the CEO of the Cardano Foundation for how long now? Actually, on the day of recording, I believe it's uh, about one year and maybe uh, two, three days. Well, here we go. So uh, you, 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 you've done a lot of the heavy lifting so far, and there's a lot of exciting things to talk about Cardano over the next couple of minutes. Uh, maybe to give you a better background to our audience, uh, what we're doing with this series, which you know obviously is to where we go deep, uh, we do a deep dive on some of the major crypto assets out there to really enable people to learn more about them. And today, obviously, we'll go, we'll do a deep dive on uh, Cardano and really try to explain to people and share. Uh, what 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 is Cardano? What is uh, ADA or ADA? And also, how is it different from some other cryptocurrencies out there? And maybe to kick it off, Frederick, maybe can you give us a bit of quick um, history of Cardano? Uh, you know, the token its creation, and you know, and let's kick it off with that. Sure. Um, so uh, the founder is, of course, Charles Hodgkinson. So he's a very famous, uh, sometimes a little bit notorious player in in the system, and. Um, After he left Ethereum, I think his plan was actually to exit the crypto market. So he wanted to do like one last uh, appearance, which was a TED talk. And after that TED talk, a a lot of people basically approached him and said, you know what, you're you're really on to something. You cannot just leave. So uh, so basically, uh, he he kind of rethought that and said, you know, what is really needed if we're going to build a you know, another version of Ethereum, you know, something different, something larger, something who's built around principles and processes. Um, so he basically, you know, got on the road of what we call evidence-driven software development. And that is, let's be honest, 
super boring for the blockchain community, but super exciting for a person like you, Henry, and me, who has been used to, you know, doing digital transformation for, you know, a Fortune 500 companies. Because what's really, really needed is not just, you know, this approach and, you know, you know, we build it and we break it and we build it and we break it. Uh, what is really needed was to take a few steps backward and say, okay, from a technology perspective and a research perspective, what is the big problems we need to solve? And secondly, from a principle perspective, we, as I alluded to a little bit also kind of in my personal history, we actually live in a siloed world. And, the, you know, the developing countries, they don't have access to the, the Bank of International Settlement. They have to go through different rails. They have to ask permission, go through maybe tier three players to get into a tier one player. There's liquidity problems and so on, right? And most of them might not even have, a, you know, proper identity or at least an identity we accept. And in the developed countries, you know, the ones we, where we sit, right, um, you know, let's be very honest about it. Those systems are not perfect either. There's a very much room for optimization. And I think COVID is really showing that, right? We don't even trust the neighboring country in terms of how they do testing or what kind of results they do. So the idea about Cardano from a principal uh, perspective was really around what if we could do uh, a better system for the developing countries and a system which is interoperable between those countries, which then creates an opportunity for the seven, eight billions around the world to have a different way of interacting, have a different way of doing transactions, but not just payments and so on, voting, governance and so forth. And how much of the, uh, how much of the, let's say the governance around the project or the protocol can we actually put on chain? So this is a blockchain which is built for 2 billion or even more people. It's not a blockchain which is built for making one individual rich or making a set of individuals rich or solving one particular problem for an enterprise or an industry. This is a multi-purpose principle blockchain which is meant to create a foundation for the upcoming world of systems, whether that is around AI and machine learning or whether that is around international settlements or giving identity to the people who don't have it. And if we take that down one level to kind of have a look about what that actually means, right? You can think about it in two or three sentences about this. So we are striking or we are seeking towards ensuring that we are building the future financial and social operating system. The intent of the system is economic identity, specifically to the people who don't have it. And actually, Henry, a lot of us actually don't really have it. We ask for permission from an intermediary every day to kind of create our identity, which is, let's say, on, on certain levels also a little bit wrong. So in, in short, you can think about it as some sort of protocol or you know, software and hardware, which allows you to represent, so you to represent value, identity, and governance all in one place. And to do that in a way where it cannot be taken over, it needs to be decentralized in such a fashion that not an, a particular, you know, conglomerate of, of people or companies or nation states can go in and actually start changing it because then we actually lose some of, let's say, the security we are gaining. And security has changed, you know, with the implementation of cloud technology and blockchain. We've seen a huge trend of what we accept, right? So uh, I think that's some of the features which I think is very often forgotten around what we're trying to do in Cardano. And that makes it a little bit boring and it makes it a little bit more slow than other protocols. Well, actually, so let's go, on, let's go through a more deep dive on some of these ele elements. You mentioned, obviously, the goal of the uh, Cardano protocol is to represent value, identity, and governance in one place. And obviously, this needs to be decentralized. So let's go down to one of the, the let's say, one level deep. Uh, for example, can you share with us, for example, the, the speed of transactions? What is the cost of a transaction to take place? And also, if you don't mind, the role that uh, ADA plays as well within the ecosystem, within the Cardano ecosystem. Let's start from, let's say, um, let's start with like the, the speed of transaction and let's go on cost as well. The protocol which is out there right now is actually not the version 1.0. So we're actually not out there with what we call the 1.0. In certain ways, even though we have, you know, Fortune 500 companies and we have, you know, millions of transactions, we're actually not in a place where we are. We're still kind of 
I would not call it an MVP, right? Because when you have that amount of, of ecosystem around it, it's hard. But when we look at the original roadmap, we haven't even focused on the transaction speed per second. That actually comes later with something we call Basho. You know, right now we just went into the Alonso hard fork, which basically gave us programmability, gave us smart contracts for the first time. So we actually only had smart contracts for three weeks. So when we compare ourselves to, against, you know, other large players who had smart contracts for, you know, two, three, four years, right? Uh, we had just started, right? So we're just coming now. And Basho uh, will bring us this scalability in terms of transactions, but we haven't really seen a large cap on it. And what ADA and why it's interesting to see that, that what ADA is and what is not is because that is actually one of the main jobs for the Cardano Foundation. So when you think about the Cardano Foundation and what, where we play as one of the federated players in the Cardano ecosystem is that we are trying to ensure, first of all, that decisions are made to optimize for the future generations to come. So we are thinking about building principal technology for future generations. So very often in the blockchain ecosystem, unfortunately, in my view, we are looking at taking decisions which is optimized on T plus one. So what is the, what can we do who actually creates adoption tomorrow? Or what can we do right now to prove that there's a great blockchain use case here? That's not how we think in the foundation. We think about, you know, what is the decision we need to take to ensure that we have the maximum adoption and the maximum utility and that we touch the average person somewhere in the developing countries. So when we in 10 years time look back that we created a significant improvement for that person. The second part, which is important, is how do we actually ensure the access to the Cardano protocol? And that's where the token plays in. So if you're sitting right now in China, and to take an example, which I think a lot of your audience is very interested in, and you're saying, all oh, right, I want to use this, you know, this magnificent Cardano decentralized protocol, which is the most decentralized protocol out there in the market right now. There's nobody even coming close to us in terms of decentralization. Um, how do I get access to it? And you get access right now by holding the ADA token. It's coming from ADA Lovelace, which was the first computer programmer. Again, a definition question. You can think about, you know, who was actually the first. We, we kind of like to think of her as not only being female, but also the first computer programmer. And um, when you have that, you have the action uh, the, the opportunity to enter a transaction. And as you know, in blockchain, anything who goes to the ledger uh, has to enter and exit with a transaction. So that doesn't need to be a, a financial transaction, but nevertheless, you spend an ADA, a utility ADA, to do something. Our model is very different, again, than other models, and we might revamp it a bit as we go along, but the model really looks like this. So there is a fixed fee, A, plus a variable fee, B. And the Cardano Foundation's purpose of one of the places where we are very much focused so we say where do we put in our efforts and where don't we to optimize towards time is that we look at b so b is is basically composed of how many bits is in your transaction so let me give you an example if i'm transferring uh, 1 million ada or i'm transferring 100,000 ada it's exactly the same price that might be like it's less than a percentage difference why is it the same price well because if you look at the binary code it's the same amount of bits you know, from wallet A to wallet B, you know, you know, the numerics is about the same and so on. But if I do a smart contract or if I do an NFT or if I, you know, create an asset or if I, you know, the more business value you capture on chain, the more you pay. So when we're looking at the, you know, the performance variables in the Cardano Foundation, we're saying, okay, so it's not about having the most, let's say, it's not about having the transaction costs going through the roof, but the more people are willing to pay to use the utility value, the more enterprise or personal value they capture in this decentralized trust mitigation system. And that means that they find utility value. So um, a good example is that we just had the Cardano Summit, uh, which was this celebration of, let's say, finally smart contracts after a couple of years of waiting. We had over 80,000 people signing up for our, uh, we had events over 40 different places around the world. And we also had a virtual environment and it, it was a fantastic weekend, right? One of the things the foundation did there is we published what we call an impact challenge. And this impact challenge is, uh, is a cooperation with something we call Veritree. 
So we're looking at looking at the carbon footprint of the Cardano blockchain and how can we ensure that we're not only from an economic perspective becomes the most economic sustainable blockchain. And we can think about, uh, we can talk about that as well, but also how do we become, you know, really as close as possible in whatever you can do of mathematical models as carbon neutral or even think about, you know, you know, basically adding to the world. So when you're using the Cardano blockchain, you're basically, you know, sucking carbon away from the air instead of many other places where you're using large computing power, the opposite. And there's obviously a difference. We have a, uh, have an advantage being a proof of stake compared to proof of work blockchain, right? Which also makes sense from an economic perspective. And over that, you know, over the last week, we've planted or we, we basically raised already uh, 300,000 ADA, which is equivalent to 300,000 trees planted, which mainly will be mangrove together with very tree. Now, why is this interesting? This is interesting out of different aspects. So first of all, well, something good for the planet, something enterprise ready, enterprise architecture, which is very close or reducing the carbon footprint. Check, right? Secondly, supply chain. Supply chain is one of those most discussed back and forth. How do we reduce the cost of transparency? And a lot of these projects, you know, you, you buy a tree or if you have a certain bank account, a green card, right? You, you know, for every time you spend it, you plant a tree and then there's a little picture coming up in your app and you're thinking, I wonder if there's even a tree planted. And then some CEO says, yes, there was a tree planted, right? So there's a lot of lack of trust in that equation, right? With very tree, we know that it's certified. There's tokens, the trees are, you know, monitored, et cetera. So it's also a supply chain solution. Third, in blockchain, one of the big issues I see from a regulatory perspective is metadata. So how much metadata do you actually see on the biggest blockchains in the world today? When you buy a token who's issued on a, like say a top 10 blockchain, it's very hard actually to figure out what you bought. And you have to go to a centralized database and you have to kind of look up an inquiry in that database and figure out, is that like a security token? Is there a SAFT on that? Or, you know, is it a utility? Or what is it actually, right? Because the actual transaction doesn't have a lot of data. It's just a set of hashes and, and characters. And one thing which people don't know about the Cardano blockchain is that we are the leading blockchain on metadata. So you can save, you know, thousands of kilobyte of metadata on the chain without even going to, you know, off-chain incorporations. And that allows us actually on this very tree token uh, to save, you know, equivalent of a PDF file, which actually describes the token and describes the functionality, a bit like what we do with an ISIN number, but now in an immutable database. And last but not least, the platform value. So the, let's say, you know, in the old days we spoke about what is the platform value of Facebook? So what is the reach, right? And I think, you know, 300,000 trees, in one week. I mean, that really shows that we have a reach and we have an ecosystem, not just of developers, but also of passionate, you know, Cardano fans who is willing to go to the vision about changing the world. So that's, a, you know, an example of how you get access, you know, through ADA to a live use case, which is running right now. So if you have the time, uh, let's get to 1 million trees. That would be great. So we'll come back about the Cardano community, but I just want to, Frederick, I want to deep dive on some of the elements we just discussed, right? So obviously, uh, there's a lot of obviously criticism in the community that obviously with the Alonzo hard fork, uh, really the smart contract functionality just became available now. And obviously, there's a big debate in the community, as you know, people, a lot of people, you know, believe that the Cardano is late to the game. Uh, others believe actually Cardano because of the peer review mechanism. Uh, you know, it's actually with obviously it takes more time to come, to come to fruition. What's, what's your view on that? I mean, do you believe that? Um, is, is it better? Like when we look at blockchain, is it like the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the turtle can win the race. You don't need to be number one from a speed perspective, but actually building, you want to take your time and make sure the infrastructure is properly done from that perspective. It's funny that you say that, right? Because our virtual environment on the Cardano summit was a giant turtle. <laughs> so in certain ways saying it with the turtle coming too late to the race, right? I, I kind of like that. So nicely picked up, Henry. Um, so for me, it's, so I've been building banks and asset managers and exchanges for close to 20 years. So for me, what is most important is reliability and resilience of the technology, right? But also the ability to use that over generations, right? So I don't want to, you know, when somebody is taking a decision on a nation state level around voting, well, that's a three to seven year decision. And 
how many of us actually know where these blockchains, the decentralized ones are in three to seven years? Do they even have the same functionality features? Are they supported? Did they happen to fork? You know, what even happened there, right? So I, I'm one of those who love to experiment. I love to innovate, but I want to innovate to change the world. And I think we are, and I've been quoted for this and some people say, you know, they never say it again, Fred, right? But I do think we are a couple of years late to the party on smart contracts, but I actually think that's an advantage because the way we've done it is that we've separated the computing layer and the accounting layer of the blockchain, which is dramatically different from an architecture perspective than what you see on, for instance, Ethereum. So can you share with our audience, what do you mean by that? I mean, obviously there's been a lot of talks about layer two and the likes, so let's, let's focus on this topic. So can you show us more how you guys separate and how do you believe like it's a smart contract, the execution is different, let's say from the Ethereum blockchain, for example. Yeah. So, so first of all, the, the, the programming language we've chosen is, yeah, it's, it's for the capital markets world is, is very well known, but for the rest of the world is not right. So the, so it's Haskell. We have five entryways to get in there. So we also did some, some, uh, some derived computer languages specifically for, for lawyers and for capital markets people. So you can do a, you have a UI with a GUI and stuff like that. Right. But, but everything is, you know, the core is written in Haskell. Why is Haskell a smart choice? Because a lot of people are saying, Hey, Fred, that's this, that's a bad choice. So if you look at the amount of engineers, the so computer engineers and coders out there today, the numbers has been debated a little bit, but most people believe it's around 26 million. So that's only about 26 million people who's able to write code out there, which I think is really low and probably an issue going forward. Out of that, only 0.03% of the 26 million have had some exposure to blockchain and, and crypto. So when people are saying, you know, there's not enough developers on, on, on Cardano, I say, yeah, that's true, but there's not enough developers in the whole blockchain space if we really believe this is the way we go. The second part is we've seen that some of the very kind of the, the early blockchain languages, uh, not to point anybody out, but like Solidity, uh, is now during the years became, you know, pretty easy to use, right? So there's quite a few developers who understand it. There are some really good libraries out there. There are some good compilers. You can do quite a lot by reusing and there's a vibrant, you know, GitHub community and so on. But what it really lacks in my view is formal verifications and formal specifications. And I think that's again a part where we took a different architectural view to it. And, and this is really early days and formal verification specifications and, and design, right? So it's really hard to, to get a hundred percent certainty from a mathematical perspective that your code is accurate. But what you don't want to get to is in a place where you have to do a line by line with human eyes through millions of lines of code. So what Haskell and, and partially also Rust and other languages have in common, which is usable on the canal blockchain is that you might not get to 100%, but you can get much, much further than you can do on, on, on other languages in terms of these formal verifications and checking that the code actually is doing what it's supposed to do in a mathematical sense. So you can use computing power instead of you know brain power because you know as well as I, when you start looking at, at, at code, uh, for us who don't use it very much, but also for people who do it a lot, if you're not in the headset of the guy who wrote it, it becomes like a Sherlock Holmes game, right? And from a regulatory perspective and from an audit perspective and from an oversight perspective and from a, you know, if you're an investor and you're buying into like some kind of an application who's supposed to run in a, I don't know, in a DAO or something like that, or, or even just, you know, for profit optimization, that becomes a huge risk. The other part is where does the smart contract lie? So what we've seen with, um, with, I, I really, really cherish what Ethereum has done for the global blockchain community. So this is not about good or bad. It's just observations, right? But when you look at what's happening on Ethereum is that if you want to do something just a little bit complex, right? So something more than an escrow account or something, you know, like a, you know, like, a, you know, a structured product who has some certain barriers and knockouts and has some different oracles, right? You, you, it doesn't fit into the smart contract because the smart contract lives life on the system, right? And it just explodes. So what you you end up doing is actually you end up referring to things who lives outside of the smart contract, right? Which basically is in certain ways when you have this kind of complexity in it, it gives you some some opportunity for attack vectors, but you also give you a lot of complexity. So what we've done is actually that the smart contracts, they actually, the computing power of the smart contracts lies outside of the chain. But what lies on the chain is the actual transaction, right? It's the actual data, the lock, right? So we're trying to say, you know, 
the blockchain should do what the blockchain does best, which is this, you know, immutable ledger of information, right? Who has a high security layer and so on. And what we want to have outside of that is we want to have, you know, certain things like smart contracts. We want to have code. We want to have some access with, uh, with, with the uh, side chains. Like, uh, this will be our Hydra, which is coming later. It's going to bring the transaction speed at least up to, uh, we think around a thousand, something like that. And when we add Mithril to that, we'll go even higher. Um, so that has to lie in a different place and that is a different architecture. And what we see in the last three weeks is a lot of people who's been trying to write Solidity code or, or, or who's coming from that area, right? Who's coming from that architecture and they go to the Cardano blockchain and they can't figure it out because the architecture is different. So we're trying from the foundation side to, to try and, and teach people that, that, that flex in the architecture. And it, it's, it's funny, like things become hardly engraved in us as people, right? It's just how we are, habits, right? <laughs> sure. But actually on that point, I mean, I would argue that's uh, kind of similar to the roll-up principle that Ethereum and other blockchains are looking at, where there's some data that is actually on chain, on chain and some that is actually taking place off chain, right? Which is a bit what you, what you mentioned. One thing as well, I just wanted to touch upon as well, some of the things you mentioned, and Frederick, I just want to d- d- do, go a bit more in depth. For example, the fee structure, right? You're mentioning, you know, when I when I hear about the Cardano uh, fee structure, where like you, you refer to it as an A plus B uh, component, it also reminds me uh, again. I know we're comparing with Ethereum, which is maybe not the right thing to do, but I mean that with uh, you know the base fee plus a tip uh, change that Ethereum blockchain recently went through as well from a fee structure perspective as well to try to actually stop the variability of the of the, of the payment. Can you share with us more how that works? So what is like in the Cardano blockchain when I'm making a transfer a transaction, for example, how does the A plus the B work? A you mentioned is a stable amount, and then can you elaborate more? How does the B work? And 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 actually, uh, I think for a lot of listeners will know, obviously, Cardano operates on a proof of stake protocol, a consensus mechanism, I'm sorry. Uh, so actually, how does actually that is that reward mechanism is given as well? So the kind of the, the, the fee mechanism aspect. So this also touches a little bit of sustainability, specifically around economic sustainability uh, of the blockchain. So let's look at the consensus algorithm to start with. So this is the most cited paper in cryptography, I believe, at all is our Ouroboros. Uh, and there's actually other blockchains in top 20 who's taking our design principles and have implemented that. So we're super happy about that. But it also gives you a little bit of a worry, right? If you're coming from investment banking and capital markets, as you also do, Henry, right? We always think, oh, if you give everything away for free, you know, uh, what's left for the community, right? And that's basically a very good question and is churning away certain things. But uh, what it basically is, is, uh, is as random as it gets, you know, there's nothing really random in the universe, right? So, but it's basically a random selection uh, of the stake pool operators and is optimized in a certain way. So we work with something called the K factor and the K factor is basically the optimal amount of stake pools which the network has. But this is for the staking, right? So it's whoever gets the rewards on the staking side is randomness, which I think is, is fair. Well, it's, it's, I'm answering your question actually, but it's uh, the staking, the optimal amount of stake, uh, stake pools. The stake pools is what, you know, in, in, in Bitcoin would be the miners, right? So this is actually the people who keeps the network alive, right? So right now we have over 3,000 stake pools, but we actually have a K factor of 500. And what that basically means is that when you get to a, to a certain level, a certain saturation of your stake pool, what then happens is that it will start giving you a negative advantage. So if you think about it, your stake pool has zero, right? And then you get more and more stake. People trust you, right? And then you get up to a certain amount, or I think it's around 64 million at the moment. And when you get over 64 million, the network will negatively decentivize that you get the block. And what that basically means is that it will, you know, the larger you get of a certain size, the more negative advances you're getting. So that's the first thing which is really important to understand. And what the reason we've done that and the reason where there's such much talk about the K factor and what is optimal is because in classical proof of stake, basically the bigger your stake pool is, the more you get. That leads to centralization, right? So we have already here a parameter here who's basically ensuring that we have decentralization built into it. And we can move around that based on community consensus and, and so forth. The other part, which is, you know, extremely important is, you know, that, you know, everybody needs to understand that that random selection is really a random selection as much as you can get in math. So what really happens is that compared to a proof of work protocol, right, it's not about who has access to the most CPU power and most electricity by that, right? There's other elements as well and how fast you can get things to run, right? But ours is, is, is can be run on a Raspberry Pi or, or Stone Pi. So a lot of our, you know, 
a lot of our developing countries, they're actually, you know, they're starting with an $80 Raspberry Pi and they start running a stake pool in the community and suddenly they have an income. Suddenly it's so beautiful. They're actually not just by speculating, but they're adding infrastructure to our decentralized blockchain for millions of transactions for $80, right? And you can even an Amazon web service, not to point those out, others do the same, right? You can get one year for free and you can set up a pool as well. So actually, we are also thinking a lot about accessibility to run that kind of infrastructure. What is actually needed so you don't need to go to you know, these very optimized stacks. So that's the first part. The, the second part is, is you know, what does it cost and how does it work, right? So protocol blockchains who has you know, a capped inflation, right? So, you know, how many millions and not one more than that, right? Is the miners, or in our case, the state pool operators, right? The SPOs, you know, what is the incentive when there's no more money to be, uh, no more utility tokens in our case to, to mint, right? So what actually is happening is that in the early days of these blockchains, the treasury by minting, right? They will basically pay the majority of what it costs to give away you know, uh, stake to the proof, to the stake pool operators. But over time, that's gone because if we are operating with a hard cap as we are doing and Bitcoin is doing, right? It will never get really done. It's an, you know, it's, it will get very close, right? Who then has to pay? And that's actually where this transaction fee is going. So the transaction fee today is basically being split. There's another protocol parameter who controls that. So a little part of the transaction fee basically goes to the, to the stake pool operators and a little part goes to what we call the decentralized treasury. And the best way to explain that, even for super technical people, I can come with the math formula as well, is when you go to one of these great parties where everybody brings a dish, right? And you, you probably have that where you live as well. So everybody brings a little bit of food. And what is funny is that when you're left or when you leave the party, there's way too much food. So you need to get to a place in the ecosystem from a game theory perspective that everybody brings more than they use. Because then there is sufficient amount in the decentralized treasury to allow voting for protocol updates, to allow, you know, tasks to be outsourced, to allow development, academic research. So a bit goes to one side and a bit goes to the other side. And you wanted me to be very specific about the cost. So where there's a difference on us compared to others, and we might be able to change that in the future, we are looking at bubble fees and other things because there is some concerns with our pricing right now. So right now it's quite simple. There's a protocol parameter who says what is the fixed fee, right? Uh, and then there's a protocol parameter saying, you know, for how many bits and bytes does that compile to on the edit? But that's it, right? And that means that you can actually calculate if you stay in ADA and you don't go to dollars or something else who fluctuates as wildly as other things do, right? But if you stay in ADA, you can actually calculate to the dime what is your transaction cost for every single transaction, and you can, you know, extrapolate that out into the next many years. Now, the problem comes because you you don't know what, what the network is going to do in the future. So there might be a decision that we're going to change that and add some babble fees and other things. But right now, fully calculatable, and we're going to let it stay like that. We want to ensure that you can always calculate what the fees are on the Cardano blockchain. So there's no marketplace as such where you're saying, oh, you know, uh, if the if the network is overloaded, you know, we just increase the price and you don't see these spikes where you're suddenly paying thousands of dollars to do a transaction. That's not the case. So most transactions, reality is they're costing around 0 0.17 kind of ADA, right? Uh, and then you see that we also have another fee, which is called a minimum UTXO fee. So I don't know if you're familiar with how account-based and UTXO-based is running, but the way that transactions are compiled is quite different. And that gives you an, uh, actually a really great advantage because they have a, a, the ability to give you a local state of the system compared to a global state. Just to clarify, when you're starting Frederick, obviously the, uh, the, the network is very decentralized and more decentralized than other uh, blockchains. This is what you're referring to, right? The fact that actually uh, there's the, of a mistaken consensus mechanism, that is where you believe uh, it's more decentralized than others, right? And that's the first question. The second thing I just want to good if you could touch upon is that, uh, like, let's say compared to other blockchains, let's take Ethereum again, because I think that's what a lot of listeners know. Yes, the fees may increase if there's a lot of demand for transactions on a certain block. Uh, I guess what is uh, different with ADA or the, the Cardano blockchain is that that is not the case. The, the transaction fee that will be paid is, does not increase depending of if there's an increase of, of demand, for example. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. I see. Okay. So 
Yeah, that's that's exactly correct, and I think that's extremely important. I remember I was uh, helping um, another bank, and they were about to get the banking license. They were, they were building a tokenization platform, and we had a huge discussion, right? Because they said, "Oh, we need to build that tokenization platform on a decentralized protocol." And I said, "You're absolutely right. That makes so much sense." And they said to me, "Oh, you have to do that on Ethereum." And I said to them, "No, I don't think that's a great idea because if." You don't know what the cost of the of the network is in the future, yeah. and you just know that the more successful it gets, the price will increase. You're basically, you know, you have a you have a negative problem, right? And now today they built this beautiful tokenization platform on Ethereum, and 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 first of all, Ethereum is closing down. It's becoming a new version, like a 2.0, a beta version potentially, right? <laughs> but secondly, right, nobody wants to to tokenize anything on this platform at scale, right? Because it's just too expensive to use it. And then they're looking at a a forked version of it, and and so on. And I think it, for enterprise architecture and for architecture which is built for billions of people. It's so important that you have, it's, it's not about what the price is. It's about clarity of the function of the price. It's about being able to, when you take a choice, which gives you a little bit of a sticky situation, you're stuck with a platform choice for many years, that you understand what is the cost of use and what is the risk of use. And if you can't get to that, I think, I think it's hard. It's a hard sell. So a couple of things, Frederick. We already ran over time. There's a couple of two, three more things. I just want to the, the, the deep dive because I think it's important for our audience to understand. One of them is obviously, obviously, we talk about Cardano. I know there's, there's something you guys call the five eras. Obviously, we had the Shelly upgrade a couple of months ago. We just had at the time of recording the Alonzo update, where uh, as, you, as you just mentioned, we added a smart contract capabilities. Uh, but you know, could it be useful? Let's say when these eras have concreted, like became become a reality. How is the Cardano blockchain going to look and what are the big milestones our listeners should expect over the next couple of months as these uh, eras and these upgrades come into play? Let's say in one minute, if you can give us a quick summary, Frederick. What Shelly really brought us was native assets and the, uh, the ability to issue assets on the blockchain. Gokun gave us programmability, right? So the ability to program. Uh, Basho is going to give us scalability, including side chains and, and, and so forth. And Voltaire is the, is the governance piece, right? So we already have, you know, 400,000 unique votes in every fund, right? But we need much more on-chain uh, governance. And that's what Voltaire really is going to do. I see. Okay. Uh, and when is that ex expected, by the way, timeline-wise? Uh, I, not the guy you ask for timelines because timelines slip and uh, I don't want to commit to that. But I think that, uh, I think, you know, we need a couple of more hard forks in Gogan to really kind of exit that. But Basho and Voltaire has actually been done in a paralyzed format. So we're already, you know, building on that. And you can see Catalyst is a huge part of Voltaire and Mithril and, and Hydra, which we spoke about, is getting very ready to roll. So, uh, that you probably see some of the first things coming in in the next year on that. So, uh, I think you will already kind of start feeling it. But when we feel that we are kind of finished with Cardano 1.0, you probably see another great party, but uh, it will take a bit of time specifically. <laughs> governance and if i want to do one call out if if you want to look at something which is really brand hot with the market hasn't picked up on yet is blockchain governance blockchain governance is going to be the battle for the next 12 to 24 months what, what do you think so there's a war on regulation coming for instance and a part of that is really around what does decentralization mean what does meaningful participation mean when you say block production is decentralized does that compare to that you can roll the network back who has access to genesis keys or you know where is the money flow going who actually decides is it six people in a boardroom in switzerland who takes decision even though i vote on chain but the thing is just not implemented because the guys don't like it or is it really trying to capture you know the decentralized brain of of the future population when you look into governments today do you really you know can anybody like with the heart on on the heart say i have the best politicians who's doing the best for me so liquid voting and frequency around that and how this is going to run a lot of that is being happening already now in blockchain and what we see today is that the systems we have today is it doesn't fit where, where technology is and doesn't fit where the human evolution is so i think this governance thing is going to be much bigger and much harder to solve than digital identity or assets and tokenization yeah uh, i think we could have a whole podcast on uh, blockchain governance i think there's a lot of things uh, going on there one thing i want i would definitely want to ask you for the is obviously um uh, rightly or wrongly, obviously, people always compare uh, Cardano as, you know, the Ethereum 3.0 or the, the, the Ethereum competitor or killer, depending which camp you're in. But I mean, how if it, uh, putting aside Ethereum, what what other blockchains do you see as your main competitor? Do you think they, they actually uh, are going in the same journey or vision 
the as as Cardano. So actually, first of all, I, I I never really looked at the other blockchains as competitors. I'm actually the guy who says, you know, the the market we are in as blockchains, uh, we're competing in a totally different space. We are actually not competing against each other. We should actually be pushing the market of ERP systems and voting systems and transaction systems together. But if you want to force me down that road, I actually don't think Ethereum is a is a competitor, even though they've done amazingly well and they really proved a lot of things can happen. But the people I, or the blockchains I'm looking a lot at is the Web3 Foundation. Um, I think the, you know, Polkadot that, you know, is amazing work they're doing. They're actually using something, you know, the background in, in one of our papers for their consensus algorithm. I think Algorand is doing amazingly. Uh, it's really, really beautiful to see what they did. Um, um, there's a couple of others, uh, which I'm, which I'm looking at, right? But right now I would say Algorand and, and Polkadot, uh, with the Web3 is, 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 is amazing. Uh, I think Tessa has done some really good things around governance. Um, but it's, I, I'm really looking into these, for me, proof of stake, uh, and derived version of that. So it can be, you know, uh, proof of utility or proof of contribution and so on. I think that's the right way to go. Having a, Having, let's say, sorry to say so, but having a optimizing towards access to electricity and, and, you know, those kind of things that doesn't make sense for me. It's not the way you build security. Um, so, so this proof of stake and proof of derives is, is the way to go going forward. And that's what I'm looking, for, you know, having a view on. And then obviously I'm having a look at, you know, the R3 quarters and the other, let's say centralized private blockchains, because for me, it's very interesting to see the gap in between because you sacrifice a lot of security and you sacrifice a lot by going that route. But it's very clear why people are willing to do so. And the more we can capture those features and add that into the decentralized layers, the more the world would benefit of decentralized architecture and open source compared to these private things. So one, one last question. We already ran over time, and I really apologize to, for our listeners, but I really want to make sure we capture some of these really important differences. Uh, one of them quickly is uh, uh, really, again, in 30 seconds, I mean, what really amazes me, uh, Frederick, is when I see a lot of the, the Cardano community, they're very, very passionate about it. You know, and what do you think is driving this? Do you think it's belief, the common good of the future of uh, Cardano? They, I think they're very passionate from that perspective compared to other communities. I think it's the principles. I mean, the Cardano community at large is there because they see a problem in the world we're living in today. Yeah. And they've identified and have enough technical flair to understand that we have a real shot for changing the world. And there's a big difference in being passionate about a cause, a vision, a principle, or being passionate about getting rich as fast as possible based on some kind of, you know, uh, you know, token who's trading wildly somewhere. And I think the other fact is that if you see that the Cardano community, they've been around for a long time where we actually didn't have a lot to show for, right? And now when we have a lot to show for, that community is being protective, but is also augmenting itself. And I think, you know, that we had over 4,000 developers in our private testnet coding away on smart contracts before we went live is a testament. Having bank and enterprise developers being allowed from the banks and the, and the enterprises to spend the time and the effort to learn about Haskell in our private testnet also shows that, you know, we have built a really solid foundation here and we can now add other things around that. That's awesome. So, Frederick, we really have like two minutes. What I'm going to do right now is my bell is back, and I'm going to ask you really quick fireside questions, and I need literally one or two word answers uh, from that perspective, and I'll have the bell to basically keep us on time. Are you ready? Yes, go for it. Here we go. If you had to go to a run, I know you're a big mountain runner. What is your favorite mountains or uh, you know area to run? I would like to do a run called Tour de Glacier. It's 450 kilometers in the Asta Valley in Italy. Oh, beautiful. Here we go. If anybody of our listeners comes to Switzerland, what is the one dish they need to eat? Uh, I think it would be a, a, a rosti on a mountaintop next to a glacier with uh, <laughs> onions and brown sauce um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and some eggs and a bacon on top of that. Yeah, the, the good old original Swiss food. Here we go. Yeah. What is the one thing you miss the most about Denmark, your native country? Uh, some of my close friends and family. All right, very good answer. Uh, Frederick, uh, what industry would you be in if you're not in crypto? 
I actually don't consider myself to be in crypto. I consider myself to still be in capital markets and, and, and system implementation. So I actually very often think of myself as a banker or a democratized banker. But, uh, so I, I would, I would probably go back and build a bank. And I think you can build a bank with 52 smart contracts, three ledgers and about five people. So probably found a bank uh, based on decentralized blockchain. Love it. If you could have a lunch with one person dead or alive, who would it be? I think Elvis Presley. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> well, I'm not a big fan, but the way he kind of, you know, you know, I don't know. I mean, I want to know if he yeah. lives on the dark side of the moon. <laughs> um, well, let's see. What is your favorite now YouTube channel or Netflix series that you do watch when you're relaxing? Oh, I don't have one of those, but I really like there is a... Um, There's a series where they all wear six pens. I was, it was maybe I saw it a year ago and I really loved that. It's about the coal mining and so on. And I can't, for the love of God, just remember what it is, but they all have six pens and, and they have all these unions and the fight between unions and what is right and wrong and cartels. And you saw all that power dynamic about, you know, really asking the question, what is the right way of doing governance? And what is the right way of uh, allowing liberty and freedom to prosper in a society in a depression? And I thought that was very inspiring to see. We can have another chat a whole about that as well. And last question, Frederick, what is keeping you up at night now? What is keeping you up at night? To be honest, the world is keeping me up at night. I, I feel that we are, we haven't been as polarized as we are right now. And I think we are not taking the right choices and we're not even asking the right questions. And I, I really hope that we with Cardano and other blockchains can come and, and enable technology to, to kind of bring a part of the solution, not the whole. But it really doesn't look good at the moment, to be honest. I think we can have another podcast I'll run onto that topic as well, I think, Frederick. Well, that was Frederick Grigard, the CEO of the Cardano Foundation. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening today. Make sure to click subscribe if you like this podcast. A new episode will be released every second week. Uh, also, if you want to stay on top of the latest developments on crypto and the future of money, uh, make sure to also follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter, especially from a weekly crypto capsule show where I summarize the global crypto developments that you need to know in less than 60 seconds. And also, don't forget to subscribe on LinkedIn to my weekly newsletter called The Future of Money, where I share three big ideas on the future of money that you need to know each week. And today we discuss a lot of educational topics as well. And this is one of the things we're trying to do uh, today. We covered, obviously, Cardano. But if you, learn, you want to learn more about crypto, uh, make sure to also check out my YouTube channel where I have not only videos of previous interviews and the one we did today with Frederick will be on as well, but also a lot of other crypto educational videos as well. And the good news now is that all my video content, content is now available also in French, Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, as well as Spanish on my various YouTube channels in those languages. So thank you, thank you for joining me today on this episode of the Future Money Podcast. Thank you very much, Frederick, for being with us and see you all next time.